15 minute or less lecture series, Human Anatomy, Chapter 7, The Skeletal System, The Axial Skeleton, Part 1. The axial skeleton is the bones that lie along our midline, aka the uh, central bones that do not include our limbs. This includes the 22 bones of the skull, the hyoid bone in the throat, the auditory ossicles in our inner uh, middle ear, however we will not talk about those, the verbal columns bones, and the bones of the thorax or uh, thoracic cage. The 22 bones of the skull, as you can see, uh, our skull is normally color-coded. Oh wait, psych, it's not. So, when two bones come together in the skull, they form an immovable joint, which is called a fibrous joint. However, in the skull, they're referred to as sutures. The ones that you need to know the names of include the sagittal suture, which is between the two parietal bones, the coronal suture found between the parietal bones and the frontal bone, in the back, the lambdoid suture between the parietal bones and the occipital bone, and on the either side, the squamous suture between the uh, temporal bone and the parietal bones. However, when we're initially born, not all of our sutures have formed because the bones have not completed the intramembranous ossification process. This is why infant skulls are soft, because the sutures, many of the sutures are still just uh, mesenchymal connective tissue waiting to become ossified. Uh, when you look at the skull, you see it has a variety of cavities to hold and protect delicate structures. There's the cranial cavity for the brain, the oral cavity for the tongue, and entrance for the uh, digestive system, the uh, nasal cavity of the nose for the entrance and exit of the respiratory system, uh, paranasal sinuses found inside of bones of the skull that help to lighten the skull. They connect to the nasal cavity, and of course the right and left orbits for the eyes. Uh, if you look at the cranial cavity, you see that it has uh, three different layers or uh, lengths of floor. So you have the higher up anterior cranial fossa, where the frontal lobe of the cerebrum rests, the middle cranial fossa, where the temporal lobe of the cerebrum rests, and the posterior cranial fossa, where the cerebellum of the brain rests. The orbits are formed by the union of seven bones. So the roof of the bone uh, of the orbit is made up of the frontal bone and part of the sphenoid bone. The lateral wall is made up of the zygomatic bone primarily and a little bit of the sphenoid bone. The floor is made up of the zygomatic bone, the maxilla bone, and a tiny, tiny bit of the palatine bone. And then the medial wall is made up of the maxilla bone, the lacrimal bone, the ethmoid bone, and a little bit of the sphenoid bone. The nasal cavity is also made up of a variety of bones. This includes the nasal septum, the wall that separates the nasal cavity into two sides, which is made up of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, the vomer, and the septal cartilage, which isn't bone, it's cartilage, but still important. You also can see how the roof and the floor of the nasal cavity is formed by different bones, horizontal plate, and the palatine bone and the maxilla bone forming the floor and the sphenoid bone, ethmoid bone, nasal bone, frontal bone, all helping to form the roof. If you get rid of the nasal septum and look at the lateral walls, you can see that there are bones forming lateral walls, the nasal cavity as well, including the ethmoid bone, uh, the inferior nasal concha, which is a bone of its own, part of the lacrimal bone, uh, part of the maxilla, part of the palatine. Um, so yes, there are a lot of bones that have to come together to form the nasal cavity. Paranasal sinuses are spaces found within some of the bones of the skull. They help to lighten the weight of the skull as well as to act as resonance chambers. Uh, you have the frontal sinuses in the frontal bone, the ethmoidal sinuses in the ethmoid bone, the sphenoidal sinuses in the sphenoid bone, and the maxillary sinuses in the maxilla bone. Uh, there are openings to the nasal cavity besides, of course, <laughs> the opening of the nostrils. You have openings to all of the Paranasal sinuses, they all open and empty into the nasal cavity. Also, you have an opening for the nasolacrimal duct. This is a tear duct that goes from the orbits and carries tear fluid to the nasal cavity. A cleft palate is a congenital condition when a person is born and the maxilla and palatine bones did not fuse properly. So the oral cavity is open to the nasal cavity. It can cause a lot of problems in life. Fortunately, it can be uh, corrected after many, many surgeries. So here's an infant form of cleft palate, and over time he receives a number of surgeries that eventually repaired 
this art palette so that it's basically functional and normal. All right, there are 22 bones of the skull, eight cranial bones, called that because they help form the cranial cavity, and then the 14 facial bones. The frontal bone right here in blue is forms the anterior portion of the cranial cavity, helps form the coronal suture, the orbits roof, the parts of the roof of the nasal cavity, and houses the frontal paranasal sinuses. An area for, thickens in the very front of the frontal bone called the frontal squama. And then there's a ridge. The ridge line that helps form the roof of the orbit is called the supraorbital margin. Uh, the parietal bones. Parietal bones form most of the superior roof of the cranial cavity and also the major cranial sutures that we have to know the names of. There's the left and right. Uh, then we have the occipital bone. The occipital bone, posterior portion of the uh, cranial fossa. It helps form the back of the cranial cavity. It has a passageway for the spinal cord. From the lambdoid suture, it also articulates with the first vertebra of the vertebral column. Um, when you look at it by cutting the top of the skull off and looking down, you can see that on the sides are two jagged holes. These jagged holes are the uh, jugular foramen formed when the uh, occipital bone articulates with the temporal bone. You also have the hypoglossal canals a little further down. You can just barely see them in these pictures. They're for the hypoglossal nerves. Uh, on the outside, you can see there's this bump called the external occipital protuberance. There's also this large hole called the foramen magnum, where the spinal cord exits the cranial cavity. And then these two rounded knobs are the occipital condyles that articulate with C1. The uh, temporal bones are lateral bones. They form most of the middle cranial fossa, help form the cranial cavity, house the middle and internal ear, uh, helps form the squamous suture, and articulates also with the mandible, forming the only movable joint in the skull. Uh, as you can see, it has this process sticking out called the zygomatic process that articulates with the zygomatic bone. You have this uh, little depression called the mandibular fossa for forming the uh, temporal mandibular joint. You have an opening and leading to the external auditory meatus. This large, thick, and rough patch called the mastoid process, and this long, skinny point called the styloid process. Put the skull over. You can see the carotid foramen, which is for the carotid artery, as well as the stylomastoid foramen between the styloid process and the mastoid process. Also, on the inside is an opening for the internal auditory meatus. The sphenoid bone is shaped sort of like a butterfly. It's called the keystone cranial bone because it articulates with all the other cranial bones. It also forms part of the anterior middle cranial fossa, nasal cavity, and parts of the orbits, as the sphenoidal nasal sinuses. You can see if you look down into an open skull, there is two large openings for the optic foramen, for the optic nerves. There's this depression here called the cella tersica that houses the pituitary gland. Uh, there's the lesser wings that are in the anterior cranial fossa and the greater wings that help to make up part of the middle cranial fossa. Uh, if you look at the additional foramen, you have the foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, foramen spinosum, and a jagged foramen lacerum. Uh, if you flip it over, you can see the pterygoid processes or on the bone by, spinoid bone by itself, uh, the pterygoid processes. And of course, there's this fissure, the supra superior orbital fissure. Uh, the ethmoid bone helps form the anterior cranial fossa, parts of the orbit of the nasal cavity, the nasal septum, has a passageway for olfactory nerve, and houses the various sinuses. Uh, this rigid point sticking up into the uh, cranial cavity is the pristagalli. Uh, then you have these uh, lateral masses that help to form the medial wall of the orbits, the perpendicular plate that helps to form the uh, nasal septum. Uh, the cribriform plate plate is the tissue that surrounds the cristagalli that's also part of the uh, roof of the nasal cavity. It's where the foramen factory nerve passes through. Uh, there's also a small bump near the top on either side called the superior nasal concha, and then a larger bump on either side that's from the lateral wall of the nasal cavity called the middle nasal concha. Um, here's just another view of the cristagalli with the cribriform plate around it, and the lateral mass, the particular plate, the middle nasal conchi. The nasal bones are now facial bones. So we've left the cranial bones and are now entering the facial bones. There are 14 of them, two nasal bones up to form the bridge of the nose. Uh, you have the one vomer by itself, sort of triangular. It helps to form the posterior and inferior portion of the nasal septum. You have the two inferior nasal conchi on the right and left sides of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Their projections help to swirl the air as it comes into the nasal cavity.
the lacrimal bones helps form part of the medial wall of the uh, orbits, as well as forming the little uh, channel that enters the nasal cavity. So it allows uh, tear fluid to enter the nasal cavity. And the beginning of that is called the lacrimal fossa. Uh, then there's zygotic bones, zygomatic bones, or cheekbones. Uh, here uh, they are. You can see there's a little edge that sticks out of the zygomatic bone called the temporal process. Temporal process articulates with the a zygomatic process of the temporal bone, and together they form the zygomatic arch. So the zygomatic arch is the zygomatic process of temporal bone and the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Palatine bone looks sort of like the letter L. Um, it helps form the roof of the mouth, the hard palate in the posterior portion, as well as part of the nasal cavity and orbit. It has the horizontal plate that helps form the roof of the mouth and the perpendicular plate. Uh, the maxillary bones, right and left, there are two of them, help to form the anterior hard palate, the floor and nasal cavity. They hold the upper teeth. Palace of sinuses helps form the orbits. Um, the portion of the maxillary bone that helps form the hard palate is called the palatine process. Uh, the uh, uh, maxillary bone also helps form the inferior orbital fissure in the orbits. There's also a foramen underneath the orbits called the infraorbital foramen, and then the portion of the bone that holds the upper teeth is called the alveolar process. Then we have the mandible. The mandible helps to form the uh, oral cavity. It's the only movable bone of the skull, and uh, it holds the lower teeth. It has a lot of structures associated with it, including the condylar process that helps to form the temporal mandibular joint, the mandibular notch, and the coronoid process. On the inside of the mouth, there is the mandibular foramen. It's an opening for uh, nerves. This portion is called the ramus, uh, where the ramus joins to the body, which is the bulk of the mandible, you have an angle. And within the body, there's a hole on either side called the mental foramen. And then, of course, this tissue that holds the lower teeth is known as the alveolar process.